Hello there, my name is Proslav Mikhailov. I am the head of training at Software University and I'm also a software engineer here. Today we're continuing our programming fundamental journey by covering what strings are and more specifically we'll cover some utilities because you already use strings, you know what they are. Now we're going to expand that knowledge and cover some new stuff about how to manipulate them. Um, and we will also learn about processing text that is not only storing text in a string but also processing it in some way. So we will cover what a string is, that's more of a recap because you already know that. Uh, we'll see how we manipulate strings, we'll see how we compare them, concatenate them, how we search in strings. The first two parts you already know about comparing and concatenating, but the searching part might be something you have missed. Uh, we'll see how to extract substrings and how to split strings and when that can be useful. Then we'll see how to build and modify strings. Now that might sound a bit strange, but essentially um, we'll cover this bottleneck that uh, this optimization flow there, there is present with strings and we'll see how to solve it using the string builder class. Whoops, sorry. So that's the agenda for today. I can't wait to get started and I hope you feel the same way. I'll see you in the next video. Now it's time to start by recapping what a string is and also covering some details which, you, which we haven't covered before. Now a string is represented by the system.string class in .NET Framework. This might sound a bit strange because I'm sure Thus far, you're used to using string with lowercase letters, name, well, first name is equal to Presla, for example. Okay, so I'm sure you are, you are used to this. I just told you that there is actually a thing called system.string last name equal to Mihail, which is a string as well. And that's true. Actually, what this is, is the actual string class and this is something we call an alias. So an alias is something like a nickname, a short version or a different version to name something. For example, uh, an alias for press love is press. My friends call me press because it's easier and when they call me press love, I know that I made something wrong or they want to like argue with me or something or they're very serious. But when they call me press, they're very friendly, everything's okay. So, that's an alias in real life. It, it, essentially, it's like a nickname. In programming, an alias is, in this case, the real thing, which is system.string, and it is represented by the alias string with lowercase letters. When you write string with lowercase letters, it's the same as, write, as writing system.string. No difference, okay? It has the same things. So that's one thing to have in mind, and you have other aliases as well. For example, for integers, you have system.integer. Well, int32, I think, num2 is equal to 60. And this is actually the same as the other thing. It's, there's no difference. It, as you can see, I can just use system.int32 like a normal int and it acts in the same way. The same goes for strings, okay? So, that's one thing. Another thing I want to mention is that I told you that there's system.string, but do you have to write it uh, every time? Well, actually no, you can omit this, you can remove it and it will still work. But that is given that you are using the system namespace. When you haven't written using system, it means that you're trying to use the class string, but it's not obvious which namespace it's from. Maybe it's from the system namespace, but it can be from an external library I gave you where I claim that I've made a better string than the default, than the default string in C Sharp, okay? So that's one thing to, cover, to have in mind, that you have to write using system if you want to write the shorter version of 
the string class, which is just string. If you don't write it, you can still use it, but you have to explicitly write system.string. Okay, so that's one uh, thing aside to have in mind about namespaces and using directives. Uh, the next thing is that string objects are immutable. So what immutable means is that the thing, once it's created, doesn't change. So it's very similar to something being constant. Um, and I could give you an example of something immutable in real life. For example, I have a friend called uh, Jovko. That's a Bulgarian name. It's a bit strange. But anyways, Jovko has a big mouth and he has opinion on everything. So he's very stubborn. Uh, and due to that, uh, if I, even if I try to convince him in whatever, he'll never listen because he has his own opinion. So that thing, having his opinion and his opinion not changing, is immutable. So Yovku's opinion is immutable and no matter what I do, I can't change it. In the same way, Yovku's opinion is immutable, so is the string in C sharp immutable. What I mean by immutable is if I write string name equal to press love and I want to read it, I can write name uh, square bracket zero. What this means is I want to access the element at index zero. Uh, as you know, strings are represented by character sequences um, and you can access the different elements of this character sequence just like you would access an array. So arrays and strings are very similar. I can read the characters individually or I can just print the string as a whole. But a big difference between arrays and strings is that strings are immutable as I said and you can change the letters as you will and here I would write M or the character M. I can't do that. The reason is, look, property string dot this something cannot be assigned to. It is read only. In other words, strings are immutable and I can't change a string's internals. Okay. I can extract things from them, I can analyze them, I can do some stuff with them, but whatever I do, the result won't be changing the string itself, it will be returning a new string which you can use. Uh, for example, something we'll see later in this uh, um, lecture, let's say I write name.contains. Here I can say, does this string contain pre? Well, actually this is not a good example maybe um, something which returns a string okay I'll just write substring you learn what substring is a bit later for now don't bother with that it's not so important and notice that if I write name dot substring this actually returns a new string that is this operation you already know what the method is this operation returns a new string which I can assign. For example, string uh, sub str is equal to this. And now I can print it, sub str. So now I have press love. Uh, and just to, so that you can see that it's something different, I'll write this, which gives me pr. So I got a substring pr, but notice that the original string does not change. Well write using here the original string does not change if I write name you still have the original press lock here it won't be modified and that's how all the functions of all, all the methods of a string work they don't change the internals of the string but they extract something from it and return that from the method okay so that's an important thing to have in mind that strings are immutable and some. This is a graphical representation of a string. I can even draw it for you here. Imagine that we have a string, a string, and it has a length five and the characters itself are hello. So that's the string. How is that represented? Well, it's represented by a character sequence, as we said, and you have the different slots for the characters. First, you have H, E, L, well, just one L, L, O. Okay, 
and you can even index them so I can say this is zero index index one two three four okay so that's how essentially a string is represented it's just an array of characters which is immutable one thing I'll give you away here is that actually strings also have an extra slot and that extra slot is used for the length I maybe I have covered that before but essentially uh, the string has to know its length in order to do properly operations with it and the way strings are represented in C-sharp is by having the normal string array but also having uh, a part of it, part of that array or maybe not the array itself but some, some data type there, some integer which represents what the length of this string is and if you imagine this is the memory, that's how a string will be stored. You have the length at the start and then you have the string later. And this might seem obvious, but it wasn't obvious in, to like programming language creators in the past. For example, I'll give you a challenge. I will even give it to you now. Uh, go and research how, so you already know how strings are represented in C-sharp, go and research how strings are represented in C, that is the C programming language, or search for C strings. Search for that and learn how they are represented, and apart from that, I'll give you another very cool thing to do, and that's to go to uh, there was this site called Joel on software back to basics so this guy Joel Spolsky is the creator of Stack Overflow a very influential figure in programming and his blog is a source of knowledge for many developers no novices and professionals alike I would recommend you go through all his blog articles and start reading them like daily, weekly, however you decide because it does offer really a, a lot of knowledge. But one challenge I'll give you here as part of this lecture is to read this act article back to basics. But one thing to have in mind, read this after you learn what C strings are. First do the challenge about C strings. This one here, that's number one and then read the article read article okay otherwise you won't get it fully after you know what c strings are you can read this article in order to understand why they're bad and why we have chosen to use c sharp white strings instead which are not really called c sharp like strings because the way strings are represented in c sharp is the way they're represented in most modern languages okay so that's a useful thing to have in mind and a really nice challenge i'm giving you here um okay and finally something you already know before initializing a string variable has no so that um why why do we have no well something we might we probably haven't covered um is that we have two types of memory so we have the stack memory and the heap memory which is a lot bigger and this is basically a subset of our memory so the stack and heap are in the same place that as hardware they're in our RAM memory but we treat the different slots for them in different ways normally in stacks we store things which are stored directly here so they take the whole slot for example if I want to create uh, something which holds five characters I would create it here and for example and it will take that much space if I create an integer I would create it here but apart from that there's an, uh, another place called the heap which on different system has different length sometimes it can be infinite that is as much as you need although in real hardware system there's nothing infinite but anyways it's very big it's bigger than the stack big and the stack is limited if you overflow the stack you have problems you get uh, some issues that's why when we have some very big data for example imagine that you want to read um, a whole article you want to store the text of a whole article inside a string that might be too big for the stack to handle you will need to allocate 
that much memory but the stack is limited and you can't therefore what you do instead is you allocate that much memory on the heap because as we know the heap is a lot bigger and then you create something called a pointer to that slot so what you store in the stack is the address in memory of your string in the heap and if you want to read it then you have to first read the memory slot and then go to that specific memory slot you need in order to see the data okay so that's a uh, a bit of an aside here it's very interesting and i actually urge you to uh, do your research and read more about stacks and heaps in order to understand how they work better but why am i mentioning this well the reason a string variable has no and not zero for example or an empty string is because if you have so imagine this is your stack so this is my stack if you have an integer and it's stored like this the default value is zero that's why that's because on the stack you have to have some value you can be it can be nothing and you have the value zero here which can also be uh, represented as a lot of zeros in binary form but essentially you can't have nothing because you have to read something and the thing you read is zero but once you have a heap memory when you add the heap into play and you have a string which is not initialized it means that you still have something on the stack but as we said what you have is not the string itself it's not the data it's a pointer to the string it's this thing here of course this uh, graphical representation but uh, it is essentially does the same way it's just the number which says where your string is located but what if you don't have a string yet well you can't just assign a random address in memory that's why you assign the address zero so you have the address zero which normally is means an invalid address so the value zero in computer memory is reserved for invalid values or something which is not existent in other words it means that you have a pointer which points nowhere that's why there is a difference between no and zero previously I've explained it with the metaphor that with a zero you have a box like this that's your box okay and I will even draw it pretty so that's the zero you have a box which is empty but with no you don't even have a box the box is nowhere to be found it's it's non-existent it's just a shadow here which has doesn't have anything okay and that was just a metaphor in order to understand the concept but in reality the thing is that you still have zeros but this is the int itself this is the in this case if the first slot here was an int this is the data itself but this is not the data of the string this is just the memory in which the string is stored and when that memory is set to zero it means that there you don't you're not pointing to anything yet okay so that's a, a useful thing to have in mind Again, an additional challenge for you is to go and research further about this. Okay, so now go out there and go through all the challenges I gave you, which are to l learn what C strings are, read the article Back to Basics of Joel Spolsky, and the third challenge I gave you is to learn what a stack and a heap is. Read more about it, okay? I won't point you to a specific article, but go and find a useful one. For example, maybe .NET Pearls stack versus heap. I'm not sure whether they will be covering this, but well, you can just read this Stack Overflow um, article or do your research. It's it's actually a pretty nice challenge here since i'm not giving an article you have to find it yourself which is one of the daily challenges we as developers have not just to learn every day but to find appropriate sources to learn from okay so that's it for me and i'll see you in the next video now it's time to see 
how we manipulate strings. That is, how do we use them to achieve different goals we might have. For example, how do we see whether one equal one string is equal to another? How do we see whether um, a string contains some characters? Things like that. That's what we'll start incrementally explore, exploring. And the first thing we have to check is how do we compare strings. Now, for string comparisons, there are several ways basically you can do it. First, there is something we might we can say dictionary-based string comparison, uh, which means to check <coughs> if one string is greater than or equal greater than or less than or equal to another string based on their alphabetical order. What does alphabetical order mean? Well, imagine we have two strings. We have A, B, C, and we have A, B, D. Now, if these strings are compared, it will, uh, what the result will be is that this string is greater than the other because in alphabetical order, this string is greater than the other in the way that when you compare the, the characters one by one, you get to a character which is um, further away in the English alphabet than another. For example, uh, here you have character A and character A. They're both equal, therefore for now these strings are equal. Let's go to the second character. If we have B, then we see that again we have the same character here, therefore we go forward. And finally we get to character C and D. Now C is less than D in the English alphabet because in the English alphabet you have the characters A, B, C, D, E, F. So as you can see C comes before D here. Therefore we can say that C is less than D. And alphabetical order, alphabetical comparison means to check everything character by character whether their um, symbols are less than or greater than the other um, strings characters. In real life this works for English letters but here uh, it can work for symbols as well. For example if we have uh, the symbol AB exclamation mark while well, here we have AB percentage one of those strings will be less than the other in alphabetical order. The way this is decided is by checking the character codes of these characters in the Unicode table. For example, if the exclamation car, uh, character is, let's say, um, I don't know, 62, and the percent sign is 65, therefore, if that's the case, this will be less than the other, okay? I'm not sure if that's exactly the case here, but you can always check by either creating a simple program in C-sharp or um, looking it up on the internet. So that's alphabetical order. And the way you can um, do it in C-sharp is by using string.compare. Let's, let's see an example. So I have two strings. String str1 equal to abc and string str2 equal to abd. Uh, now what does this return? It returns result. Int result is equal to string.compare str1 str2 okay cool so <coughs> now it, it, it's, it's a bit strange here let's first print the result and see what the result will be so and let's start of the case where the strings are equal abc and abc now in alphabetical order abc and abc are equal that is they're the same string therefore what we get as a result is zero. Now this is a strange result. Normally you would expect something like true or false. But here we don't have the information whether the strings are equal or not. Not only that, we have more information than that. We have information whether one string is less than or greater than another in alphabetical order. Um, and in order to represent this, we need a bigger data type than a Boolean. A boolean can store only two var values that's why we need an integer now how does an integer help here well if the strings are equal let's see what this int means so given two strings 
str1 and str2 if str1 is greater than well if str1 is less than str2 this means that the result will be minus 1 let's check if that was exactly the case because I'm not sure well okay let me this gets buggy from time to time so what does minus 1 mean well minus 1 means that the first string in relation to the second string is um, lesser it's to the left in alphabetical order in, in programmatic terms it's lesser than that if the strings are equal str1 is equal to str2 this means that the result we'll get is zero zero denotes that um, well my friend is playing counter strike that's really cool um, I have to turn all that notifications okay cool so um, if the strings are equal we get a zero okay and finally if str1 is greater than str2 what we'll get is a one the one denotes that the first string is greater than the other in alphabetical order or whatever order you desire because you can specify the order let's see that so here the strings are equal if this is less than the other for example if i use abb this means that the third character is less than the third character in the other string in this case therefore it's less than the second string in alphabetical order that's why we get minus one minus one means it's to the left if it was the other way around if this was abc and this was abb then we'll get the opposite result we'll get one because one means that the second that the first string is greater than the second string in relation to the second string the first string is greater that's why we get a one that's what these uh, numbers represent and one thing to have in mind here is that it's not necessarily it doesn't necessarily have to be a one or a minus one the specification that is that they can be less than zero when str1 is before str2 or it can be greater than zero when str1 is after str2 that's why you shouldn't um, check explicitly for the values minus one or one when you need to you should check if they are less than or greater than zero that's one thing to have in mind and that's how you can compare in alphabetical order some strings you can also do a case sensitive um, comparison for example here if i have a b c and a b c like this the result is one which means that this string is greater than the other but if I say true which means well in this case it's ignore case that's what it says here maybe you can't see it completely but that's what it says then the result will be zero because when you supply a true here it means that you want to have a case insensitive comparison okay the default version is case sensitive as in the below example here okay cool so that's how you can check whether to how two strings rel relate to each other okay it, it can be helpful for some tasks of the exercises the next thing to do is check if two strings are equal and the way you do it is by using equal equal operator for example if i have string uh, str1 equal to something from the terminal this is the same thing I can say if the first string is equal to the second string print uh, they are equal or in the other case print they aren't equal so I run this program and I write press and press and I get they are equal because that operator I showed you checks if the strings are um, the same but if I write something different press and press A then there aren't equal okay you can even check it here with the debugger I write press and press up 
and we check if the first is equal to the second but they're not therefore we print they aren't equal so basically this works the same way it works for numbers it just check if the numbers are equal but in this case we check that the strings are equal and this is something you would expect right it's not something new one more thing to have in mind is that you can use the um, equals method which acts the same way for strings it doesn't act the same way for any object so you can write str1.equals str2 and it will work the same way it's just um, well it's not an alias to the other thing uh, we covered what alias was already uh, but it works in the same way for strings this is a important remark because uh, it might not work for in the same way for some other data types so have that in mind now play with that try to compare strings and try to um, more spe specifically don't focus so much on this because this is obvious focus more on this part where we compare strings how they relate to each other for example one mm, challenge I'll give you is write a program in which you input two strings and you print out how they relate to each other whether the first is to the left to the right and things like that but not only do that before doing it um, ask the user to guess whether the string is left or right in order to test your understanding so I would expect something like this input two strings you know str1 and str2 so that's what you get as input in some way and then the user gets asked uh, how are they ordered or something like that and expect minus one zero or one and then check whether the user's input matches whatever the uh, method returns as a result okay so that's your challenge I'll see you in the next video. The next thing we can do is concatenating strings. This is something you're very fond of, I assume. Um, you can concatenate them using the plus or plus equals operators you've already seen, or you can use the string.concat method. Let's see that. Uh, we have two strings again, and I can concatenate them by writing str1 plus str2. I write press and laugh, and I get press laugh. Okay? But I can do it in a different way. I can write string.concat str1 and str2, and once I get that, I'll get the same result. Okay? So it, the concat thing is, works the same way uh, it works for the plus operator. One thing to have in mind is that any object can be appended to a string. The reason is that in C sharp, any object can be created cast it to a string that is it can be converted to a string independent of what the object is in other words if you have a string and some number i can write uh, str1 plus str2 plus the number so a b c e f g which is not the same in the alphabet, but anyways, as you can see, I can concatenate strings and numbers. This works for any object. Now, that doesn't mean that you can apply the plus operator with any object for numbers. For example, if you have a number and you want to sum that number with, um, well, I don't know, a date time, it won't work. You get some kind of error. But here for strings you don't have that. You can concatenate the string to anything and basically concatenation means to sum this up, mm, gluing two strings together, getting the first one and gluing it to the second one. You've already seen that and I'm sure you've used it a lot in previous exercises. Now play with this a bit, don't focus too much on it because you already know it and if you've done all your exercises you should be familiar with it and I'll wait for you in the next video. The next thing we're going to explore is how we search in strings. What the searching means, well, one way of searching for it is this. If you want to find a character or a substring within given string. What does a substring mean? Well, essentially, if you have a string, let's say, hello. Well, I should write it. 
character by character how low so this is the string and you're searching for l o as a substring then it means that this is the substring where this well string resides so given a string you can check whether it is part of a bigger string or any string uh, and the way you can do it in C sharp is by using the index of method. For example, here we have an email, well, vasco at gmail.org, and you can check what's the index of the at sign. So, index of what this returns is an integer, and the integer denotes the index where that specific character or string is found. Let's see that. Um, if I have a string, email equal to press at pmihao.com well I should put the semicolon there I can check what the substring is int index equal to email dot index of the at sign and I can print it out so it turns out this function this method returns four and the reason for that is that the add sign is present in the string and it's at position 4 because this is 0, 1, 2, 3 so it returns the index where that string is found and it can be not just a symbol, it can be more it, you can search for add pimihao and you get the same result because that's where the substring starts so what this index of uh, method returns is the index where a given phrase starts in your string okay um, and one more thing is that if you're searching for something which doesn't exist for example at gmail not at pimihalf which is not present in this string you get as a result minus one minus one is an invalid index in the context of arrays as you know um, and in the context of a return number from uh, index of method it means that the thing wasn't found so it this is something like returning false uh, like n it wasn't found anywhere so here's an invalid index to denote that okay cool so that's the index of method that's how you can use it another thing is that there's a variation called last index of so you can check what the last index of some phrase is what is that used for so we have a phrase to be or not to be and we're searching for B here B is found two times it's found here first and then it's found here second the question is which index will the function return it cannot return two indices so when I run string dot index of it returns the first index where the substring was found but if you want to return the last index, you would use the last index of method and then you get 16. 16 is the index where that this B starts. So it's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Okay, cool. So this is where the substring starts. So that's one another way you can use searching in strings specifically searching for indices okay cool now play with that a bit and let's move on in the next video we will see a task in which we'll use this knowledge now in order to further grasp it now let us look at the problem where we have to apply searching for a string before we start of course i will advise you to try this problem on your own but of course you should first hear what the problem description is so you're given some text and some pattern and you have to find how many times that pattern is seen in the text for example in this case we have the pattern AA and it's seen once twice thrice four times five times that's what you get as a result essentially you should use the index of operator but every time 
you should start from searching for whatever you're searching for from a different position. For example, from the first time you start searching for the from the start. The second time you start searching from here. The third time you start searching from here and on and on and on. That's your task. And this is not something we covered actually, but you have to explore um, what other parameters that method takes. So do that, read the documentation of index of that method and see how you can use it in order to not derive the first place where some uh, pattern occurs, but the second one. Well, not the second one, but uh, the pattern starting from some index. That is, I want you to say, look, I want you to search for this, but don't start from here start searching from here okay so that's your task pause the video now and attempt it okay cool so how do we solve this well we know that we have to do some cycle in which we count uh, and we'll have some input of course for status so let's write that string um, text is equal to console.read line one thing um, you should have in mind is whether the search will be case sensitive or not. For example, here, what will happen if this wasn't a small b but was a big one instead? Will we still get three occurrences or only two? So that's a good question to ask here, but from these examples, we don't get an answer. That's why later when we test our program, uh, we'll see whether it succeeds from the first time and if it doesn't we'll try to modify it in order to make a case insensitive search so but for now let's forget about that so we have text and we have some pattern okay next up is we want to find the index where this occurs so we know how to do that index is equal to text dot index of some pattern which we want to find and then we print it. For example, if I'm given ABBA AAA and I'm searching for ABBA, I get zero. That's fine. But what if I have ABA ABA and I want to find the second time this occurs, not the first time? Well, what we can do, as I told you, is you want to start searching for some pattern starting from some index forward. And here, if you write comma, Notice how you get a second parameter. It's an optional one, but you still have it if you want to use it and it's called start index. That is you want to you can specify from which index to start searching. For example, if I write three here and I write ABA well, sorry. I write ABA again, mistake. ABA ABA and I'm searching for ABA. Notice how I won't get index zero here, but I'll get index three. That's why, that's because I told my string to start searching from here, from index three, not from index zero as the default one. And that's how you can do it. So now we can start using it. And how we can use it is that given a string, so we have some string, A, B, A, A, B, A, A, B, A. And we're searching for ABA. So what we'll do is first we can start searching from the start. Once we start searching from the start, we'll find some index and the index will be zero. So the found index will be zero. But afterwards, after we find zero, the next time we search, we'll start from zero plus one. That is from index one. That way we can make sure that the next index we'll find will not be zero, will either be the second place where this string occurs or it will be negative one if it doesn't occur anymore. Okay, and after we search it for the second time, we'll find the substring here and we'll get as a result the index zero, one, two, three. So we get the index three. Okay, and now we saw that our pattern was found as for a second time, but now we can attempt a third time. We can say start from three plus one and search for the pattern again. And this continues on. So how can we implement it? Well, 
what we can do is we can say look for now while this is true um, the index will be equal to text dot index of the pattern and the previous index plus one here we start from zero we can leave it like this and then we print it okay cool and now let's write ABA 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 okay notice what happened here when we started first we got three as a result which is this thing then we get six which is three four five six which is this thing so we get the indices where our patterns begin although we didn't get the first one why didn't we get the first one well that's something strange for me oh yes we have to print it here because otherwise we got the index we need here and then we are searching for the second one but we didn't print the first one okay so try again aba well sorry aba 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 so notice how here what you get is first in zero index zero index three index six and then you get minus one once you get minus one and you continue you start all over again but once we get minus one we can stop because once we get minus one it means that we've already found all the occurrences of this pattern therefore we can write while the index we are searching for is different than minus one continue doing it so i write the string again and notice how this time we get zero three six minus one okay so that's how you can uh, find all the occurrences in this case we found that it was three of them all that's left to do now is just count them so we can write and count is equal to zero and we increment at each step so count plus plus finally we print it and once we do it i write aba 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 then i search for aba and i get three as a result let's see how this works in more detail i am putting a breakpoint here and i'm starting to search so i write my string now first i search for the first index starting looking for the pattern in the text and i get index zero the counter is zero and while our index is different than minus one we search for it again and increment our counter when we search for it again this time we get three because we said look search for the pattern in this string ignore the first part and in this leftover string the pattern begins here which is index three so that's why we got in this index three here now the index is not minus one yet because we have found another occurrence therefore we search for the next one and in the same time we increment the counter so the counter is two now and the next index where our pattern is found in six because we said look i want you to search for the pattern in this part ignore the first part and here the pattern is found here okay and that's where index six is so we increment again we search for the next one and we get minus one when we get minus one where well, we know where that we have to stop and the counter is three now so we stop executing this while loop and print whatever the value is okay cool so that's the the task and now we can test whether everything is okay i submit my solution and i get 80 points now normally you wouldn't see the problem oh oh wait you can you can understand what the problem is from this example cool so i got this thing welcome to software university welcome to programming let's just split it in order to see what's it better and we're searching for well so where is well found? Well, it's found here, here, 
here and here. So we have four occurrences, but we only detect two. Now, why do we detect only two? Again, pause this video and think about it if you need to. If you already spotted the problem, congratulations. Now I'll give it out to you. The problem is that we're not detecting these cases in which we don't have the exact string, but we have it in some mixed case. That is, we don't have well in lowercase letters, but we have them in uppercase letters. So in other words, we have to do a case insensitive search. And how do we do that? Well, the easiest thing you can do is you can get your strings and before you work on them, I'll write them out. So if I write A, B, A, A, B, A, A, B, A, and I'm searching for A, B, A, I get only one, although I need three. And notice how I have my strings in the moment. But what I can do is when I read them, I can make them to lowercase. And that way, now our strings will be, well, you won't, ma the case won't matter. Because this time, if I write the same string again, and I'm searching for ABA, before starting anything, I am first lowering all the characters. That is, I'm making all the capital color. Uh, capital letters, smaller, small letters, and the small letters are left as they are. So that's how I can make a case insensitive search. And let's try again then. I remove these lines and submit my task again. Okay, after doing it, I get 100 points and the task is complete. Here is another solution which is very similar to mine, if not the same. Okay, cool. So now if you haven't done this task already, do it on your own without looking at the video. Even if you haven't completed the task on your own, and you've just looked at the solution, it will give some benefit if you try to derive now the task on your own without peeking at the video anymore even after you know what the solution is. Okay, cool. So that's it for now, and I'll wait for you in the next video. Now it's time to cover a bit more concepts. The next thing is substrings, which we already know what it is, but a substring essentially is, well, here we're given just the, how we use them, but look, you have some string like this, and it's here. And you want to find some substring. Here you have two numbers. These two numbers mean the index where you want to start getting the substring and the length of that substring. For example, here it means that we start at index 8 and we get 8 characters. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So we get Riwa 2005, which is a, actually Riwa is a really nice mountain in Bulgaria. If you haven't gone there, I advice you do it's really cool but essentially let's get back to the point <coughs> with substrings uh, you can extract extract part of the string if you need for example let's say I have some I don't know maybe so well string name is equal to soft uni that's my string if I want to get the substring the uni part I will have to write name dot substring and then I supply two things. Where I start from? In this case at 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. I start at 4. And I get three characters. And then I print it. What do you want? Okay, everything's fine. And I get uni as a result. So let's write the original string as well. So when I get the substring of soft uni starting from index 4 and taking three characters, I get uni as a result. Another way you can use the substring is by just supplying the index where you start to. When you do that, then what happens is that you start getting the substring at that index and get all the 
substring up until the end of the current string. For example, if I want to take uni here, I could have written this, but since it occurs at the end of the string, I can just write 4. And it will still work, because I just get whatever sub substrings left starting from that index up until the end. But if it was something else, if, if it was soft uni is cool, when I do the substring part, I get uni is cool. Maybe that's not the thing I wanted to get. That's why I'll have to supply a second index, which is how many characters to get. In this case, we get only starting from here and taking three characters. So depending on the case, you can use the second or the first method. It's your choice. Now, try that out yourself. Experiment a bit with it. For example, the challenge I'll give you is write your full name in a string and then by using this, the substring method, extract your last name and write it on the terminal. That's your task. Oh, and by the way, when you do that, so actually, okay, I'll give you two challenges. Extract your first and last name. That is, you have your name, string full name equal to Preslav Mikhailov. I want you to write some things here in order to get Preslav and Mikhailov. Of course, use your own name, don't use mine. So that's your challenge. See you in the next video. Let's cover another thing. This is called splitting strings. What splitting means is to take some string and split it based on some separator. What that means is, imagine you have some strings. So you have uh, football teams. So you have Tottenham. I don't know, okay, I, don't, I have no idea how that's written. So you have Manchester United, comma, Real Madrid, comma, Bayern, Munich, just Bayern, okay? So you have that, and you want to extract Manchester United, Real Madrid, and Bayern. Using the substring method, you can extract those things. But imagine that you don't know exactly what teams you'll be given. You don't know whether you have three teams. You don't know whether they'll be exactly these. But you know, what you know is that the teams will be splitted by a separator, which is the comma. So what you can do is you can split the string based on that comma and say, I want you to split the string based on the comma. And as a result, you get three elements so when you split that you get three elements. You get the string Manchester United, Real Madrid, and Bayern Munich. Those three are three different strings. And you get them all in the form of an array. Arrays normally are denoted with square brackets. Okay, so now that's how you can extract things from a string. And here we have an example. We have a list of beers well this glitched a bit sorry about that so we have a list of beers which is Amstel, Zagorka, Tuborg and Bex I'll just write it out string beers equal to Amstel well, let's use the football team because it's more fun. So we have Manchester United, Real Madrid, and Bayern Munich. Okay, so we have that, and that's no longer peers, it's teams. And we want to extract them. What we can do is write teams.split, comma, and now what we get as a result is an array of strings which is split the teams equal to that. Okay, and now I can just use the a for each cycle. Maybe you haven't seen this before, but a, what a for each cycle does is it iterates every item in an array. It works much the same way as a for cycle, but this way you don't get indices, you get the elements directly. So I write for every element in the split teams, for every team in the split teams, I'll write them out. Okay, 
and I get Manchester United, Real Madrid and Bayern München. However, notice that Real Madrid and Bayern, well, they have some empty spaces there. That's why what you can do is you can split by semi by call well by comma and by space. So you can define several separators, not only one. And once you do that, this time you get Manchester United, but it's split as well because the space was separated. What I mean is, this is normally the first string, but string. But since we split by spaces, this is a space. We get element one Manchester and element two United. So this won't work well. Maybe we just use the comma, and we'll just stuff things together. Okay, now you get the three things. But know that you can use more than one separators. For example, you can have Manchester United vertical line comma um, dot Barcelona and specifying only the comma won't be enough because you have other separators as well and you can enumerate them here you can write use a comma as a separator and use a vertical line and now you get all the things so that's how you split the strings it can be very useful in some tasks so um, play with it a bit and learn how it works um, for example I want you your challenge is to write a program which accepts the following input okay console.readLine which accepts the following input some strings which are input like this and what you have to do is get this string, read it, and then split it so that you get every element in the string. In this case, the elements will be A, A, S, D, A, D, S, A, S, and I think you get the point. So that's your challenge in order to practice splitting strings. I'll see you in the next video. Now it's time to look at some auxiliary, auxiliary string operations. We'll see how we replace and delete substrings, how we change the character casing, and how we trim strings. <coughs> Starting with replacing and deleting substrings. How does that work? Replacing works the following way. You are trying to search for a substring and replace it with another one. And what it will do is it will change the string in a way that, in this case, the pluses will be replaced with an end. That's it. That's all it does. In case the string here is not found, I would assume the string, the initial string, won't be changed. Let's see how this works. We have some string. String STI is equal to um, what was it? Vodka plus martini plus beer. <coughs> and we want to replace something, so we write replace the plus sign with an end. What will happen now is every occurrence of this string so it's this and this will be replaced with an end but notice that this won't change the string itself because we said the strings are immutable if i print the string it won't be changed but what this method will do is it will return a new string and that will be the modified version so the new string has vodka and martini and beer in case the symbol is not found for example if i'm searching for minus i'll just get the initial string that's it that's how replace works it finds a substring and removes it and replaces it with something else another thing we can do is directly removing a substring the way this is specified is how you would specify a substring you define a start index and the length of characters you delete and those characters will be removed for example if i have uh, well software university and i write look i want to get the string and remove the the string starting from index zero and going 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine times. And once I print the result, now I get only university. Okay? You can even experiment a bit. Uh, you can get software university and you can print the result, but append to it hardware first. So that's way you that way you manipulate the string to and change it from software university to hardware university. That's how removing works. It's, it, it, it is specified the same way you specify substring, but instead of getting that substring, you remove it. Okay, cool. So that are the two operations we just covered. Uh, as a challenge for you, I want you to um, <coughs> write your full name and remove your middle name from it. For example, write string full name is equal to Preslav Krasimirov Mikhailov so that's my full name and what I want you to do is write Preslav Mikhailov now of course in your case the name will be different but the thing is remove the middle name and use the remove method this one below as for replacing what I want you to do is I want you to afterwards from this string Take the, your first name and replace it with your nickname. For example, Press Mikhailov in my case. So that's that's your second challenge by using the replace uh, method. Okay, cool. Now go ahead and do that. I'll wait for you in the next video. Let's practice the concept we just cover now with a sample problem. It's called text filter. You're given a text and a list of words which are banned and you have to go to the text and replace the banned words with asterisks. That, that way it's providing some kind of censorship. So that's the task. Um, in this case you have Linux and Windows as the banned words which are read from the terminal and then you have some text you have to go to the text and replace all the occurrences of Linux and Windows with asterisks so um, that's your task now pause the video now and attempt it on your own okay assuming you've done that now let us do it together so first we have to read the banned words banned words the way we read them is by writing read line. But notice that they are separated by a comma and a space. Therefore, what we can do is split this string by the comma and space separator. This is something we already covered in this lecture. However, once we do that, uh, we will have to use a array then. Um, well, this won't work, would it? Because it expects some characters. Let's try this instead. And let's see whether everything is as expected. So we have word in band words and write the word. So Linux, Windows. So we get Linux an empty string here and windows now why does that empty string occur it's a strange scenario here so the reason it occurs is that we have the separator comma followed by the separator of space so there is a string in between them they are actually separators and there's something in between them but the thing which is in between them is an empty string so what gets printed here actually is an empty string and I can even demonstrate it to you by running the debugger so Linux and Windows once I do that notice that I have three strings the first is Linux the second is an empty string and the third is Windows so now I have to clear that unnecessary empty string there the way I can do it is by changing the split the parameters to the split method a bit in this way first I will pass a character array instead of directly enumerating uh, separators and then I will pass coach huh how was it I, I actually forgot how that was written so I have to search for it 
C sharp remove empty spaces from string. No, not empty spaces. Remove empty entry split. Okay, that's it. So here the guy says, look, split by this. Well, this is a bit mm, obnoxious. What you can do is this. N what I was looking for. New array and string split options dot remove empty entries. So that's just an option we pass. String split options remove empty entries. Now, what this means is, look, I want you to, you know, split the string with these characters, but apart from that, remove the empty entries in the string. This way, when an empty string is encountered, it won't be included in the result set. So, if I get this, I just get Linux and Windows. If I haven't had, I haven't, if I haven't specified these options, I would get a bunch of empty strings instead. So Linux, Windows, as you can see. Okay, so that's why this option is very uh, handful, come in handy and you can use it a lot. Okay, so that's how we get our band words. The next thing we had to do is read our text. The text is just console.readLine. Okay, and now all we have to do is go through this text and replace all the occurrences of the band words with some asterisks. In other words, let's just go through our band words. So string word in band words and write text.replace the word with for now just five asterisks. Later we'll see how we specify more. And of course we have to modify the text at each step. So let's try. Um, I have this as input and I specified here. Well, I didn't print it in the end, that's why I didn't get any results, so I'll print it. Okay, after I did this, notice what happened. So this is the original text and this is the modified version. It is not asterisk, it is GNU asterisk. Asterisk is merely the kernel while GNU blah blah blah, okay? Which is actually pretty nice stuff. Uh, a good challenge for you is to actually research this statement here. Research what GNU Linux is and what Linux is if you're interested in those kinds of stuff. But it's really optional. Anyways. This looks to be working in some way, but let's try to, to tweak it a bit. So Linux and Windows, and I have Linux is cool, Windows is bad. Both words are censored. So this, our algorithm works pretty well. All we have to do now is change this so that you don't specify five asterisks but specify as many asterisks as the characters this word has. For example, if there are five characters, you should, you should specify five asterisks. But if there are more, you should specify more. You should already know how to do it. We've used it in programming basics when we were printing things on the terminal. The way you can do it is by using new string. What well, this, what you have to supply this is a character which should be repeated and the amount of repetitions you have. So I'll repeat this whatever the size of the word is. That way, I won't just write every time five asterisks, I would write as many asterisks as the length of this word. So now, if I write ABC, a, B, well, let's try pass. So, A, B, C, no, I want to test the length of the asterisk. So, A, B, C, um, B, S, H, O, and now I have A, B, C is a cool organization, but B, S, B, E, S, H, O is better. 
So now notice how ABC is censored with three asterisks while P, P E, S, H, O is censored with five. Okay, so that's how you, well, apply censorship in a programmatic way. Let's test this. Text filter, I submit. Now I refresh. And I get 100 points. So that's it for this task. Um, now, this is the solution. One more thing here which is used is text.contains. What this does is returns true or false whether a substring lives inside another string. In this solution, this is used. We didn't use it because we didn't need it. But that's another thing you can, which can come in handy to you. Now, if you haven't already, write this task out, even if you already know the solution, but without peeking at this video. If you're already done, congratulations, and let's go to the next video. One thing we've already seen actually is how to change the character casing. What this means is how to make the letters in a string all uppercase or all lowercase. And you have two functions for this, which are counter which are pretty intuitive, two lower and two upper. How they work is you have a string input, you apply the two upper operator. Well, let's write like this, string upper input and string lower input to lower. So upper input and lower input. Once I do that, I write A, B, C, D, E, E, F, G, H, I, and in the first case I get all uppercase letters, in the second case I get all lowercase letters. This technique, well these methods can be very useful when you're trying to do case insensitive operations on strings. So now if you have, well, there's nothing to try here, but you can play with it a bit if you haven't, if not, just go to the next video and I'll see you there. Another very useful utility is trimming. What trimming means is to, well, remove part of the string in some way. The basic, the classic way of trimming is using just the trim method. What it does is it removes the excess white spaces in the start of the string and the excess white spaces at the end of the string. For example, if I have an input and I write it out, I'll get it with all my spaces in between, as you can see. But if I trim it and I write string trimmed input, well, now the spaces at the start at the sp and the space in the end are removed. So we have this string here without the excess spaces, while here we have this excess space is here and this one here which you don't see but they are there nonetheless okay cool so that's about trimming the classic way of doing it another way is specifying uh, a, a enumeration of characters to trim so essentially you just put those characters and they will be removed from the string for example you want to trim um, spaces semicolon, well, commas, um, dots, exclamation marks, and dollar signs. So now, if I write hello like this, all the exclamation marks and dollar signs will be trimmed from the start and end of the string, which is interesting. Let's try something in between head low okay in this case this won't be trim so that's an interesting thing to have in mind this thing removes all these characters from the start and end of the string so you can use it not only to trim the white space but you can use it to trim any other kind of character and 
optionally you can use trim start and trim end which should be self-explanatory they trim the string from the start or from the end so if I have some input uh, string trim start is equal to input dot trim start string trim and is equal to input dot trim and okay cool so now we have plus trim start this is just so you understand where the borders are at this string trim start and trim end so now I have hello this is the original string this is the trim start version and this is the trim end version as you can see in either of the case you have some trim space but it's either the start or the end so that's about trimming it again can come in handy uh, play with it a bit practice it and go to the next video where we'll, where we'll learn something uh, other about strings now we'll learn something which can, in, can come in handy if you're seeking to optimize your string concatenations and operations. It's called the string builder. What it does is essentially it keeps a buffer of the string and it works the same way the string does, but it has some excess space in the end, like this. The reason it has that is that this string builder allows you to build strings. That is, if you want to append a lot to a string, this will be more optimized than using normal string concatenations. And we will explain why is that now. So when you're appending strings, imagine you have to append this string. Well, that's H A L and the string L O so you want to append them right you write str1 well this is not s str1 plus str2 so what happens is i'll show you a drawing of what happens in the memory in this case you have the first string which is this let's paint it in red and you have the second string let's say it's this which is painted in blue in order to concatenate them what happens is neither of the string changes because strings are immutable but in order to concatenate them a new string is allocated which is of size the size of the first string and the size of the second string and the strings are copied there that's how string concatenation works and when you're concatenating strings a lot you'll be allocating more and more strings all the time while if you're using a string builder the way a string builder works is that it allocates space for a string it stores the string but it doesn't use up all the space so if you have another string with some characters in it and you say look i want to append this string to the string builder it won't allocate a new string which is a costly operation it will just fill in the buffer it already has that's how a string builder works and for very a lot of append operations it is very efficient much more efficient than using normal strings that's the difference between using normal string appends and a string builder that's why we would choose string builders in some case. So you have some buffer and some unused buffer, which is kept in case you want to append to this buffer. In case the buffer is overflowed, in case you need even more space than this, then inevitably more space will be allocated. However, the new space will be allocated with a new buffer. Therefore, in the future, although you have to allocate a new string now, in the future, you would do it more rarely okay that's how the this works so um, most of these operations just use the buffer and don't allocate new objects and here you have an example for reversing strings let's let's go through an example ourselves so we have a string let's say we want to read something from the terminal 
um, and we have well int n int n is equal to um, hmm. okay let's do something simple I have string str is equal to key a d a e and you want to append it multiple times while uh, string result is equal to this so what you do is while n is or counter is less than 100 append this thing count is equal to 0 this is the counter while it's less than 100 just append result with str and increment the counter in the end you can print the result so once you do that you just see kate 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 a lot of times okay but what happens if you increase the number of repetitions this takes some time to build I don't know why actually but notice how this is uh, well slow now it takes a lot of time to do all those appends now if instead I use a string builder like this and I just write well I have to import it first using system.txt and I write new string builder like this here I change this to result.append that's how you append to a string builder you don't just write plus equals you have to explicitly write dot append okay and this will essentially give the same output but notice that this time it worked instantly that's because using a string builder for these operations is much much more optimized than using normal strings for concatenations that's why we would use, we would use a string builder so now play with that a bit do this test I did on your laptop and see what the result is in order to get convinced yourself in the next video we will explore a bit of the API of this string builder now we will see what the API of this string builder is one side note here maybe you're not totally familiar what an API is but API stands for so A P I stands for app application programming interface so it's a type of interface another type of interface you already know is your uh, smartphones interface for example you might have some options to call someone you might have some options to take pictures and things like that the way you interact with your smartphone is by touching it and selecting some icons so that's a user interface that's the interface for the end user but an API an application programming interface is the interface which is meant not for the end user but for the programmer who is developing some application with the specific thing um, for example if you want to uh, use a string builder you would use some methods of this string builder and these methods will be available to you as the programmer and those methods are the interface of the string builder but those that interface is not exposed to the end user when you're clicking your smartphone you can't see the methods of a string builder and start using them while you're playing uh, clash of clans or something like that okay so that's an api essentially in very basic terms it's the different methods some class has the set of methods which that class gives you now we will explore them first is the constructor um, if you covered well you already covered the class and object lecture therefore you know what a constructor is and how to create classes uh, and here we are just showing you a constructor of the string builder class so you're given a constructor and it accepts a capacity that capacity defines what will be the size of the initial buffer that's of that string builder uh, you, that's optional you don't have to specify it if you don't the string builder will use some capacity of its own 
Um, and that capacity holds the currently allocated space uh, in characters. Well, that's a bit ambiguous, but okay, it just holds the currently allocated space. You just specify what the size of the buffer is. You have indexer, that is, you can write square brackets on string builder in order to access the character values at some position. For example, I have result here and I have my string. So result and result.append hello. Now I can write result of zero is equal to p. Well, this is a character. And hello will be changed to pello. So this is an example of how the string builder is immutable in comparison to the string. The string is not immutable, therefore you can change its character, but the string builder is so you can modify the characters as you will. That's what this um, line here says. You have the length, what's the length of the string. For example, if I write result.length here, I'll get five because I have five characters. P, because I changed it, E, L, L, and O. That equals five. Next up, you have append. Append is something we already saw and something you will mostly used with string builders. The rest won't be so useful, but the append function uh, method is the most useful here. So uh, what append does is it takes whatever your string builder contains and appends some string onto it. For example, if I have hello, I can write result.append space world. And this way, uh, well, I don't want to print the length, I want to print the result. And this way, mm, instead of just printing hello, now we print world. It's, it's specifically concatenation. It works the same way concatenation works, but with string builder. And as I saw, showed you in a previous video, it's more optimized than simple concatenation. You have remove, which is the same as removing some substring in a string you specify a start index and a length you have insert this is interesting you can insert some string for example hello world uh, I can say result dot insert at position well position 6 insert hello amazing world Okay, once I do that, at position 6, which is here, I insert the string amazing. That's another thing you can do with the string builder, which is really useful. And you have replace, which works the same way as it works for strings. However, this time you modify the string builder itself. You don't return a new string. For example, in the kata example, if I write str.replace, k with p the original string won't be changed as you see here but you have a new string string res is equal to this and if I print it you see the change string in this case from kate it turned to pate okay cool and finally you have two string that is if you want to finish working with the string builder and you just want to get the string you use the two string method for example if I have my string builder at the end and I want to assign it in a string so manipulated string poor string it's equal to result this won't work because you can't assign a string builder to a string but if I write to string everything is well and I can get the string in the end so this is the printed string builder and this is the printed string that's how to string can come in handy the other operation can come in handy as well especially the append operation okay so that's the string builder API now play with it a bit I want you to try using the insert method the remove and the replace method in some task for example play with your full name again and try inserting some middle middle name 
or things like that or if you have more than three names uh, just play with it and have fun and explore this cool class here i'll see you in the next video now we should formally cover how the string builder can optimize appending a string we're given this code here and we have to optimize it the optimization should be obvious if you already know how the string builder works and we already saw how to use it you're given a string and you're constantly appending something to it in the end you're uh, printing it apart from that you're printing a stopwatch which just counts how fast or slow your program executes let's see how this works you have string result is equal to an empty string then you have a four cycle starting from zero going to 50,000 and incrementing every time afterwards you have result plus equal convert to string i comma 2 this is not so important what it is and then you append a new line which is escaped with an escaping character whoops sorry okay next up uh, you print the stopwatch now the stopwatch is the interesting thing here here we haven't so seen so a stopwatch is written like this I guess yep okay and this should be included I click alt and enter when I click alt and enter this the Visual Studio is trying to help me and saying hey you're missing a using directive so write using system.diagnostics that's how I include the stopwatch what the stopwatch does is what the stopwatch does in real life you start it it starts counting some seconds or milliseconds and in the end when you stop it you see what the elapsed time is the way you use it is by writing st.start you do the operation you're um, measuring then you write st.stop and finally you're printing st.elapsed well just elapsed obviously okay once I do that this takes a lot of time because we're doing normal string concatenations I already explained why this is slow when you're doing string concatenation every single time a string is appended to another string you're creating a new string rather than overwriting the one you already have and once this runs it takes 20 seconds on my computer but if I use a string builder instead I told you that a string builder is a what? a lot more optimized due to its structure, due to how it's used and it can do this operation much much slower result.append so that's it and once I do the string builder instead of doing this for 20 seconds I do it for 0.01 seconds which is a huge improvement for very large tasks it can be a great optimization okay so that's how the string builder works and that's how it help us, helps us um, it optimizes the thing let me just recap why this works this drawing here shows how strings are concatenated you have string 1 concatenated to string 2 when that happens a new string is created in which both strings are included if you're concatenating strings 50,000 times like in this case you will create 50,000 new strings how the string builder works is that you're allocating a buffer which starts with some string then you add another string once you add it it's added here but the, there is not a new string builder created then you're adding a new string and you add it here then you add in a new string let's say with orange and you add it here finally when you add the final string which is let's say uh, brown the string builder cannot include it anymore the buffer is full that's why what happens then a new buffer is allocated which is twice as long as the previous one well twice as long as the previous one all the 
previous values are copied and there is an excess space as well now normally this excess space is twice as before that is if your buffer was 16 elements could store up to 16 elements before now, now it will be able to store up to 32 elements and once you do that now you can append the final string which is brown and you write it here and you have some more space for other strings notice how the string builder has to allocate a new buffer as well but it does it as at a much slower rate than normal string concatenation if you're allocating 50,000 strings and concatenating them you have to create 50,000 new strings but with a string builder you have to do it a lot less times and I want you to calculate that that's your challenge your challenge is calculate given 50,000 strings how many times will the buffer allocate a new buffer which is twice as long as the previous one given that the buffer starts with size 4 so at step 1 the buffer starts with size 4 so you have 4 elements at step 2 you have 8 elements at step 3 you have 16 elements and this goes on further I want you to calculate how many times this will happen for example in this case if I am allocating well if, if I'm trying to append you know 17 character string a 17 character string then I know that we will have to do this process four times so in order to append the 17 character string I'll have to you know create a very big buffer here this goes on and I will allocate the string here but this essentially will be a 32 slot buffer if I'm allocating a 17 character string I'll do four growings let's call this operation growth of the buffer calculate how many times this will happen for a 50,000 um, element well for when you're appending this specific string 50,000 times by the way this string is uh what, what 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 are you not liking the name I, okay so you have 16 it's just some um binary number okay well okay that's a bit hard to um, measure so just imagine that you're appending the string kate as before so instead of appending this you're appending kate that's the string you're appending 50,000 times calculates how many times the buffer will grow that's your challenge and if you're up for a very very serious challenge I want you to derive a formula which tells you how many times the buffer will grow for an n sized total string or for n attempts so that is a bit hard but I'm sure if you're a kind of a mighty person or you like challenges like this I'm sure you can do it but that's really optional okay I'll see you in the next video now it's time to cover what we learned today finally another lecture over so we covered that strings are immutable sequence of characters they are immutable because you cannot change them change them all the operations we saw on strings today um, create new strings they don't modify the already existing strings we have but if you want to perform a lot of concatenations on strings or you want to have a string which is not immutable that is it's mutable then you can use a string builder which as we saw offers very good performance when you're concatenating a lot of strings because of the way it works which I explained in the previous video and we covered a lot of methods today like remove insert replace split all those stuff my challenge for you is if you haven't already played with all those and 
get to know them a bit in order to grasp this concept better. And once you're done with that, go and do all the exercises because that's how you will improve even more. So thanks for being with me in this lecture and I'll see you next time. Have fun and do your exercises.